this is a question I've been working on for a long time now, and the last few years have become, I would say, really quite exciting. Um, and the and the essential ideas have become more crystallized in my mind than they had been before. And it's very much about using life as a guide to the origin of life, which immediately sounds like it's uh, tautologous in some way that it's, uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> could call it turtles all the way down. It seems as if um, there, there, there's an infinite regress involved in that. Um, but it begs the question, how can we possibly know what the answer is? Uh, and if you take it almost literally and say, imagine that we had a time machine and we go back to some time around the origin of life, um, what would we actually look for? Uh, and, and the answer is, well, we would have no idea. If we found some kind of green slime or something, um, uh, we wouldn't really know. Was this the origin of life? Was this just, just some slime? Was it on the path towards life? Um, was, it, was it a failed experiment? Um, actually, what we really need to know, what we really need to have is a, is, is a framework, uh, a rigorous intellectual framework, which shows how a sterile non-living planet can give rise to a living planet. And we need to know what all the predicted steps would be along that path, um, and then how to test for them to see whether or not uh, they actually have any um, substance in them or not. Um, and, and so we'll never know how life started on earth because it's a historical question and we can't go back and if we did go back as i say we still wouldn't actually see what the answer was what we need is this uh, is this rigorous framework and that's where uh, i think life as a guide comes in because there is a spectrum and that spectrum starts somewhere almost unknowable but let's assume for the sake of argument that it was on the early earth and and that uh, it was in earth like conditions uh, rather than in outer space somewhere or you know panspermia may have happened however it tells us nothing about the conditions under which life can start so it's an assumption that life started on earth um, and we know the other end of the continuum the other end of this continuum is life itself cells like bacterial cells that have a genetic code um, that have dna and rna and proteins and membranes and everything else we know about cells uh, so we know one end of the continuum and all we need to do is figure out the other end and how to join it up um, now, what I'll argue very briefly then is that life is, is an extremely good guide uh, in, in, to its own origin, and I'm going to break it into three sections. One is energy, uh, the second is metabolism, and the third is genetic information. So I will try and address all three today. Before I get going, I'm going to just orientate you um, with, a, with a few slides about uh, what I mean by energy and so on. So this is, uh, you could imagine it as a bacterial cell. Or you could see it as the mitochondria in our own cells but effectively what we're seeing here inside this uh, lozenge shaped thing think of that as a cell um, i'm showing it respiring uh, and respiration is effectively taking something like glucose breaking it down through the krebs cycle um, and the krebs cycle you don't need to know what it is all it's really doing is stripping co2 and hydrogen out of food uh, out of any organic molecules uh, now the CO2 is a is a waste product which we um, which we expect, um, simply breathe out, uh, and um, the hydrogen is not in the form of hydrogen; it's in the form of NADH in our own cells. But it's basically two hydrogen atoms. They are being split for physicists. <laughs> we're going to get somewhere in the vicinity of. Of, um, of, of fundamental particles uh, is basically electrons and protons. The, the electrons are um, passed to oxygen in the membrane. So we have a, effectively a current of electrons within an insulating membrane through, um, through redox centers in that membrane. And the current of electrons powers the extrusion of protons across the membrane, which is what I'm showing. Let me just get the pointer up on here. So we have a charge on the membrane. The protons are positively charged, of course, and so we have a, 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 a relatively positive charge on the outside of the membrane, relatively negative inside, and that's known as the proton motive force. It drives, for example, ATP synthesis, uh, but it, it basically drives all work in cells, and that's all we need to know. We can put ATP aside for the time being and just, just think of we have an electrically charged membrane that drives powers work uh, in cells, and that I think is the fundamental thing that we need to explain. Why is it that cells work by having an electrical charge on the membrane that powers powers work? Um, 
that's much easier to understand than, than something like the ATP synthase as a, as a, as a protein. This is the next slide. Uh, I, I forgive you if you don't notice any difference whatsoever, but in fact, everything has just been turned on its head here. The Krebs cycle is now going in the opposite direction. Those arrows switched around. Uh, it's, deliberately, <laughs> it's deliberately looking the same because the reverse Krebs cycle takes CO2 and hydrogen from its environment and cobbles them together to make organic molecules. This happens in various bacteria. Um, it's pretty ancient, um, and obviously, if you if we get energy uh, out of burning uh, sugars in the Krebs cycle now, then the missing ingredient there is we have to put energy in to make these uh, Krebs cycle intermediates from CO two and hydrogen. That energy is coming from exactly what I was just talking about—a a, a charge, an electrical charge on the membrane, which is driving um, the reverse Krebs cycle to make organic molecules from. CO2 and hydrogen, simple gases in the environment. Um, and that Krebs cycle is, is the center of all of metabolism, really. We, we make lipids for the membranes. We make amino acids for proteins. We make um, the sugars and, and nucleotides from ultimately from Krebs cycle intermediate. So this is the core and the heart of metabolism across all of life. This is more ancient chemistry than the genes that appear to encode that chemistry. Uh, the genes diverge and differ in bacteria and archaea, but the chemistry underlying it remains the same. So then the third aspect is information. Um, and in this case, um, I will touch on this at the end. And there are patterns in the genetic code which suggest that there are direct interactions between amino acids and the nucleotides that code for them in the genetic code. Uh, we don't know exactly what they look like. I'm giving a couple of uh, possible ways of imagining it here, uh, but I will show you that those patterns are real uh, and they're weak and they're statistical, but they're, they are real. And this can explain the origin of information in biology. In effect, if what we have is a random sequence of RNA, we could say it has no biological information in it, um, and that templates in one way or another a non-random peptide which has function in the context of say growing protocells and I'll come on to that then then there we can select for the sequence which selects for a non-random peptide which has a function in that context and so information seamlessly emerges biological information emerges with selection on that sequence in in in, in that context and so there is no problem with the origin of information in biology if we get the context right those are some big claims there, and I'll justify them at the end. Another thing to notice about that is I'm talking about uh, electrical charges on membranes driving autotrophic biochemistry, starting with CO2 and hydrogen, to make all the components of biochemistry, which then interact with nucleotides and genetic information comes into existence in this context. In other words, I'm saying everything is happening in the same environment, and that's another big ask. I'm not saying that some stuff happens in the atmosphere over there and some other things happen in a deep sea hydrothermal vent and some things happen in Darwin's warm pond. I'm saying it's all happening in one place right now all at once. And that's, uh, that's, that's a big ask, but it's experimentally very simplifying because it means that we need, <laughs> we, we need one set of conditions that are capable of driving all this. And so it becomes experimentally very tractable. The set of conditions that drive it uh, were proposed not, not by me at all, uh, by Mike Russell uh, more than anybody else, but uh, quite a few people have worked on this over, over 30 years or so now. The conditions, again, keeping this as simple as possible, the conditions that, uh, that Mike has talked about uh, are hydrogen and CO2 uh, in these alkaline hydrothermal vents, which are um, now found at the bottom of the ocean, but also uh, other environments as well, including on land. Um, at the right hand side here, you can see that this is, uh, these are effectively a labyrinth of interconnected pores uh, on a micrometer to millimeter scale. Um, this is modern chemistry in modern oceans, uh, fully oxygenated uh, and, and is not reflective of what we would expect to see four billion years ago in the Hadean when there was no oxygen, there was much more, uh, for example, uh, ferrous iron in the oceans back then. So these, these vents should have had a, perhaps a similar topology, but the actual chemistry would have been different and would have included reactive iron sulfide minerals in there. 
The hydrothermal fluids are strongly alkaline, pH 11. The early oceans, we think, would have been mildly acidic, perhaps pH 5 or 6. And so there would have been steep proton gradients across these barriers. Um, and those steep proton gradients, in principle, um, can drive work in pretty much the same way that the proton motive force would drive work uh, in cells. It's not exactly an electrical charge, but it's very close to being the same kind of structure. This is effectively it. Uh, we have at the left-hand side here an inorganic core, at the right-hand side a cell. What a cell is doing is pumping protons out across its, across its plasma membrane. So we end up with a, this uh, high proton concentration and relatively positive charge on the outside and relatively alkaline on the inside. Uh, and it's about a 3 to 4 pH unit difference, equivalent to a 3 to 4 pH unit difference. In a hydrothermal vent, we've got, again, at least arguably, a three to four pH unit difference between the inside of a of a proto you know, of a pore, let's call it, uh, and, and ocean waters percolating into into these vents. We have a much thicker inorganic barrier surrounding it, um, and that barrier is likely to include minerals like iron sulfur minerals that couldn't drive drive some of this work. So, is there a way, an imaginable way, that we can go from one of those to the other? And this is the hypothesis in a nutshell. And the rest of the talk, I'll just give a little bit of data on trying to test this hypothesis. So, what you're seeing here is a pore in a hydrothermal vent. It's relatively rich in protons outside. Um, we have this iron sulfide barrier. Uh, I'm imagining protons crossing this barrier and driving the the reverse Krebs cycle inside uh, this this uh, protose uh, or pore, let's just call it a pore at the moment. So we've got hydrogen reacting with CO2 driven by an influx of protons, pretty much as happens in cells today. We would expect to see thermodynamically at least fatty acids, so uh, components of lipids, and probably some amino acids from that. If we look to the right-hand side, what would we expect those to do? Um, the fatty acids should form some kind of a bilayer membrane, which we can imagine at least might um, might just sit snugly inside this uh, this pore. And once we've closed down a, a, a kind of an enclosed protose cell inside here, uh, we might expect that metabolism will drive further. So not just lipids and amino acids, but perhaps sugars and nucleotides as well. So this is imaginable. This is a, at least a hypothesis. Notice also that for protons to be driving uh, the Krebs cycle inside a protose cell, we would need to have some kind of an iron sulfur nanocrystal or iron sulfur clusters, the same kind of thing that drives this work today, it would need to be sitting in that membrane. So um, you could label this wishful thinking, but you could also call it a testable hypothesis, and that's how I've been treating it over the last few years. So I'm going to break it into these three parts, and I'll skip quite lightly over it, and we can discuss uh, some of the data at more length uh, afterwards. This idea, though, that, uh, that proton gradients are fundamental, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time, um, and it's um, I, I tended to think of it in terms of driving molecular machinery rather than as simply phase separations. Uh, now, Peter Mitchell himself, who put uh, this chemiosmotic hypothesis forward back in the 19, early 1960s, had been thinking about the origin of life before that, uh, in the late 1950s, and there's a lovely quote which, uh, from a conference in Moscow in, in 1957, where he said, I cannot consider the organism without its environment. From a formal point of view, the two may be regarded as equivalent phases between which dynamic contact is maintained by the membranes that separate and link them. So when he says organism here, he's thinking of a bacterial cell, but it's, you know, instead of trying to define life as something different to the environment, he's more or less conflating them. He's describing them as equivalent phases uh, between which this dynamic uh, contact is maintained. Um, and if we think before there were any cells, before there was uh, anything living, then the idea of, a, you know, a membrane that separates and links two equivalent phases is a very productive way of thinking about the question. Um, so why would that matter? Well, in essence, it's this. Um, the problem with hydrogen is it will not react very readily with CO2. Um, this is just showing vague thermodynamics for, uh, for, for, for two steps rather than a single step, which is why I call it vague, um, through to formaldehyde. So taking the electrons from hydrogen, pushing them onto CO2 to form formaldehyde. At pH 7 or any other pH, 
um, all I really, for, for non-chemists, all I really want you to take away is it's an uphill uh, reaction. It's not going to happen spontaneously. Um, but we don't have hydrogen at pH 7 and we don't have CO2 at pH 7 in an alkaline hydrothermal vent. We've got hydrogen at pH 11 and CO2 at pH 6, say. And that shifts these equations around. And the reason for it is very simple intuitively to, to grasp. If, if hydrogen gives up its electrons in an alkaline environment, what's left behind is protons. Those protons will react immediately with hydrox hydroxide ions to form water. It's just a neutralization reaction. It's strongly uh, favored, and so it will happen immediately. Um, so so uh, hydrogen is more reducing in an alkaline environment. CO2 needs to pick up electrons. If there are plenty of protons available, they will balance the charges and then you can pick up more electrons and more protons. So it's easier to reduce CO2 in an acidic environment. So what we have here then is effectively two phases, an alkaline phase and an acid phase separated by uh, a, a semi-permeable, semi-conducting barrier. Uh, and uh, those phases have hydrogen and CO2 and should be more reactive in those phases. So this is all we effectively need. It's not clear yet whether it's electrons crossing this barrier or protons coming the other way, uh, but it's, this is really just showing you visually what I just did. We've got hydrogen on the alkaline side, passing electrons onto an iron sulfide barrier. Uh, the, the protons react with hydroxide ions to form water. Um, and on the acid side, we've got CO2 picking up protons and electrons from the barrier itself. So this, in principle, should work. It's very easy to set it up. Well, it's not so easy, but in principle, it's easy to set it up. This is needs to be done inside a glove box, an anaerobic glove box. Uh, oxygen, even trace amounts of oxygen really do play around with this. We need to have it pretty strictly anoxic. Um, this is a microfluidic chip with a barrier that's just spontaneously precipitated by laminar flow with sodium sulfide on one side. And, uh, and sorry, so sodium, so sodium sulfide on one side and iron chloride, ferrous chloride on the other side, they spontaneously precipitate this barrier. And this is just uh, one, one, uh, one piece of evidence to show you. Uh, formate is being formed, acetate also. Um, so we'll be getting towards the Krebs cycle. We have seen pyruvate as well, but we've not managed to see it on every occasion yet. And, and possibly things like methanol as well. So, um, this is stuff that I was hoping for when I last uh, last uh, presented to you uh, five or six years ago, but um, this is now uh, is being is being published in PNAS, and this is our own work, which is taking it a little bit further. So, just to come back to this figure for a moment, um, if we are able to reduce CO two to organics, and we think that they should include amino acids and lipids, uh, the next step then would be to have some kind of protocell. We've taken a, a, a leap forward um, rather than, I mean, we are trying to make these lipids as well. We've not done so yet. But if we simply take lipids that other people have successfully synthesized under these kind of conditions, um, we're able to form vesicles under these alkaline hydrothermal conditions. So this is another major step uh, because these vesicles are not supposed to be um, stable under under these pretty harsh conditions and the literature and our experiments as well show that if you have a very simple vesicle made from decanoic acid it more or less falls to pieces as soon as you change the pH or the temperature or anything else but if you have mixtures slightly messy mixtures of fatty acids and long chain fatty alcohols and so on uh, especially if you have one-to-one um, -one mixtures of these then we get uh, you can see with cryo EM and you can see with confocal microscopy there uh, we are seeing vesicles at pH 12, uh, 70 degrees centigrade, um, modern ocean salinity in the presence of calcium ions and magnesium ions. So um, it's uh, we, we, we really are able to form from the kind of uh, fatty acids that have been formed under hydrothermal conditions, you can make vesicles under those conditions. And this was another one I wanted to share with you very briefly. Um, this is uh, UV vis spectroscopy, and it's showing a classical shoulder, which was the last thing we expected to see there, because that shoulder, when we mix the amino acid cysteine with sodium sulfide and iron chloride, um, and, and that's it in water, uh, that shoulder is, is a 4FE, 4S cluster, the same thing that we see in ferrodoxin, and which is responsible for a lot of CO2 fixation in bacteria today. Uh, and we've looked at different concentrations of everything, including the cysteine. We've used MOS power spectroscopy to characterize the clusters. Um, and we've used uh, cyclic voltammetry to show their redox potential. Uh, and it's exactly the same as ferrodoxin. 
Um, this is the midpoint reduction potential, and it's about minus 450 millivolts, which is right in the region for uh, reducing CO2, though we've not yet uh, used them to reduce CO2. So it seems to be possible to make this machinery under surprisingly simple sets of conditions. So I'm going to say a little bit about metabolism. Uh, and again, I'm going to skip lightly over some, some data, and then I'll finish with uh, the, the, the code itself. So this is the core of metabolism. I mentioned uh, the Krebs cycle. This is, this is not really the cycle so much as some of the steps, so acetyl-CoA or, or some equivalent to it, a prebiotic equivalent, through to pyruvate. We're now into the Krebs cycle, oxaloacetate, alpha-ketoglutarate, and so on. What I really want you to notice here is this is CO2 at the top left, and in, in a kind of browny-red color, we've got hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. There's so lots of hydrogen in there. In green, we've got CO2. Again, the CO2 everywhere that you look pretty much. This is the chemistry of hydrogen and CO2, and there's not much more to it. When we get amino acids, we're beginning to see ammonia in there as well. The blue arrows here uh, are, are basically experiments that have been done successfully under prebiotic conditions by us and by other people. Um, there are several labs around the world doing this kind of chemistry. Uh, and the the red boxes are showing the precursors for nucleotide synthesis following the, uh, the biological pathways uh, as the starting point. So much of this chemistry has now been done. One of the things that has been missing from there is cysteine synthesis. Um, and we've, we've recently, I mean, this is about as much as we've got at the moment. It's not very much, but this is a peak uh, for cysteine uh, on, on NMR. Uh, sorry, no, that was on HPLC, I beg your pardon. Um, and, um, and, and it looks like we've managed to do a one-pot synthesis of, uh, of, of cysteine, starting uh, from, from glycine through serine to, to, to cysteine. Um, and we're also able to uh, produce aspartate uh, and, and alanine under those kind of conditions. So this is basically using life as a guide. In a lot of these, we've used pyridoxamine, which is a simple cofactor used by life, and it's that which is catalyzing these reactions. So another problem then is can we make pyridoxamine under these conditions? So there's always there's always more questions that we've not answered yet, but uh, we, we can make the cysteine. That's not published yet. This is also uh, uracil synthesis. And again, I'll skip very lightly over it, but this is following the biological pathway, starting with ammonia, carbonate, and aspartate, which I just mentioned we'd, we'd, we'd synthesized. Um, and this goes through to uracil, uh, which is one of the bases in RNA. Um, and again, this is a one-pot synthesis starting over, over here, uh, and, and we've made both orotate and uracil that way. And when we just do these last few steps going from dihydroorotate to uracil, and we try to optimize them, so we, we, we looked at a, a panel of different metal ions, we looked at different pHs, we looked at different temperatures, uh, different salinities and things like that. Uh, and worked out what the optimal conditions were, it turned out that those optimal conditions are about at 90 degrees centigrade, pH 9, um, high pressure, 100 bars pressure, uh, modern ocean salinity. Uh, so that was very gratifying. And this, uh, the right-hand side here, is showing those optimal conditions, uracil synthesis, when we, when we matched up the optimal conditions, apart from, from um, that's not high pressure, that's just atmospheric pressure. So that was an eight-fold increase in yield when we optimized those conditions. Whoops, I just hopped forward. This is uh, the last thing I'll say about metabolism, but I, I mentioned ATP a couple of times. It's now produced by this amazing rotating nanomotor, the ATP synthase. Uh, that's obviously a product of genes and natural selection and must have come later. But then the question is, so <laughs> why did ATP become the universal energy currency? And this is, um, this is some beautiful work from a, a former PhD student of mine, Silvana Pinner, who showed that at a mildly acidic pH in this case, and at 30 or 50 degrees centigrade, um, in water, starting with acetyl phosphate and ferric iron and ADP, the acetyl phosphate will phosphorylate ADP to ATP at around 15 to 20% yield just in, in water. Um, and she tried a whole range of other phosphorylating agents and none of them really worked. Carbon oil phosphate worked a little bit, um, cyclic, TMP worked a little bit, but basically acetyl phosphate does that job beautifully. And interestingly, still does that job today in bacteria and archaea. But the, the other beautiful thing about this was it works with ATP, but it doesn't work with any of the other nuclear bases. 
In other words, we can make ATP, but we can't make CTP or UTP or ITP or uh, GTP and so on. Um, so why is ATP the universal energy currency? The answer seems to be because you can make it fairly easily with minimum um, minimum catalytic requirements and simply acetyl phosphate, which is a two carbon phosphorylating agent in water uh, at reasonable temperatures and, 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 and pressures and so on. So uh, that's by no means does that say that's why ATP is the universal energy currency, but it's certainly almost uncanny that, uh, that we can make that and nothing else under those conditions. So for the last five minutes or so, um, I'd like to touch on information. Uh, and this is some of the most beautiful work that I have been involved in in the last few years. And I mm -hmm. should say that these ideas came from Stuart Harrison, uh, who did his PhD in my lab and is now doing a postdoc uh, job with me. And so this is actually, I, I, I'm used to thinking and, and I'm not used to uh, <laughs> my PhD students and postdoc coming up with the best ideas. And this is what's happened on this occasion. So it's very pleasing actually in, in, in many respects. Um, this is metabolism again, uh, as we've seen it, starting with CO2, uh, coming through into pyruvate, oxaloacetate and so on. Um, and, and in the, loz the colors lozenges are the amino acids um, and they're color coded according to um, the first base of the codon that encodes them in DNA or in RNA. Uh, and so glycine, alanine, aspartate and glutamate are all encoded by a G at the first position. Of well, the where it makes sense. Um, yeah, so you I'm get that, get that awareness and build that picture. Yeah, I was going to go to the boundary ones as well. Though I'm, I don't really like, it's quite like, I'm not going to go to the deep dive. I'm probably going to go to the overview because I feel like that'd yeah, be more be like able for I me. I think the deep dive will be a bit too technical for me. It's I'm probably sure going to be more at the practitioner level. I think you'll then. get a good sense at the high level one from what they've, yeah. um, what they've talked about. So that'd be good. Good to get immersed in that. Yeah. Uh, no, they're not gone. Shall I continue? Webinars or something on. Oh, God. Hi, Mark. Come on. Okay, I'll I'll continue. Um. So, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I think we can. Nick. Yes. Good. Um. So, so in gray, then it's G at the first position of the codon. And then in yellow, it's an A at the first position of the codon. And then in blue, it's a C cytidine. And, and in green, it's a, a U at the first position of the codon. Um, so there's plainly patterning there. And it seems to link to the distance from CO2 fixation. Uh, and at the bottom right there, uh, that's just showing uh, exactly that distance, the number of steps from CO2 fixation. What exactly this tells us is not entirely clear, um, but it, it seems to it seems to suggest that the the organization of the code or the first letter of the codon is linked in some way to the pattern of metabolism. We do have ideas about why that might be, and we can talk about it afterwards. But I'll just leave it that there's clearly a pattern there, uh, and that pattern's an interesting one. If we then um, so what we're seeing here is the is 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 the hydrophobicity uh, of of the amino acid in relation to um, the second letter of the anti codon, and we're arranging them in boxes with G at the first position of the codon, then A, then C, then then U, as we had before. And all I really want you to take away from this is there's a clear relationship that A is the most hydrophobic amino acid, um, and V is the most hydrophobic uh, base. Um, so this is, uh, there is a relationship between the hydrophobicity of the base and the hydrophobicity of the amino acid that it codes for. And at the other end of this one, it's aspartate, um, and, and that is encoded by a U, um, which is the most hydrophilic of the bases. So there's a clear patterning there, especially if there's a purine at the first position, a GRNA at the first position, we see quite a strong relationship. With where there's a pyrimidine, pyrimidine at the first position, that's less of a strong relationship, but it's not gone away completely. So again, all I really want you to take away from it is there are patterns in the code that depend on the bio, on, on, on the hydrophobicity of the amino acids and the bases, which suggest direct uh, stereochemical interactions between them. This kind of thing has been known for a long time, uh, but the patterning is stronger when we set it out around an autotrophic proto-metabolism. And this is the third position 
Uh, and again, only a couple of things I really want you to notice here, but uh, this is an inverted codon table, which is to say um, these are the amino acids that are coded. Uh, in the outermost ring, this is the, the first position of the codon, then the second position of the codon, and then the third position of the codon in the innermost part there. So just to give one example here, uh, we have glutamate and aspartate, um, and they both have a G at the first position. They both have an A at the second position, but uh, glutamate has uh, a, a, a purine at the third position of the codon, whereas aspartate has a pyrimidine at the third position of the codon. And what we see, if we, if we now switch this to the anticodon, not the codon, what we find is um, that if there's effectively a big bulky uh, base, a purine rather than a pyrimidine at the third position, then we'll always see uh, the smallest amino acid. So this is the size of the amino acids that could be coded for there. And we always see uh, that, the, that when, when there's a larger base, there's a smaller amino acid. So again, it just suggests that there's direct interactions uh, between uh, the, 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 the chemistry of the amino acids, its hydrophobicity and so on, and its size. So all of this is very suggestive, um, but there's there no doubt various ways in which it could be interpreted. And so this is the last slide then, and this is work which is uh, should be published in the next week or two, I hope. Um, and, and this is doing a mixture of molecular dynamic simulations, so all in silico, and some NMR work, which, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, but these are the first four that way. And what we're seeing here, uh, this is basically the proportion of time um, spent the amino acid spends in the vicinity of specific bases. These are mononucleotides, so AMP, CMP, GMP, or UMP. And you can, this is proline in this particular case. Um, and what you're seeing is that uh, it spends much more time within two angstroms uh, of GMP than anything else. There is a direct uh, predicted interaction between proline and GMP, which happens to be the base that codes for it at the second position of the anticodon. We see something a little bit similar underneath for aspartate, but this is much muddier in that case. It tends to spend quite a lot of time with almost everything, uh, but uh, in that case, uh, it's also, uh, I think it's GMP is, 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 is slightly, slightly better. What we're seeing in effect is we can predict 50% of the, of the middle bases of the anticodons that way. We're much better at predicting this is all the amino acids across the bottom here, and it's on a scale going from hydrophobic at the left-hand end to hydrophilic at the right-hand end, and we can get the hydrophilic interactions pretty well. The hydrophobic interactions, this method is much less good at predicting correctly the hydrophobic interactions, but still, we are, we're better than 99% of random allocations if we simply assume that there were random interactions. Uh, our predictions are better than 99%. Um, and we also, when we do NMR work and we're looking at the uh, binding constants for these, uh, it's again, it's easier to work with hydrophilic amino acids because you can get higher concentrations in water. Uh, it's, it's more fiddly trying to do it with hydrophobic bases and hydrophobic amino acids in water. Um, but we're seeing essentially the same patterns. Uh, so we are, um, they, I, I would take this as broad confirmation that there really are weak but statistically. Um, systematic um, interactions between uh, amino acids and the bases that code for them in the genetic code. And so that picture that I showed you at the beginning suggesting that there can be some kind of templating or non-random templating, that if you've got a random stretch of RNA, you will get a non-random peptide uh, which is interacting with it. Um, that seems to be borne out. In other words, as I said at the beginning, there should be no problem with information uh, at the origin of the code. That's all I'm going to say. I just want to have a final call out to the people who've been doing this work. Um, this is over some years now. I just like this picture because they, uh, they're they holding up the reverse Krebs cycle. There's just the Krebs cycle there. Uh, this was a, a birthday present they did a few years ago and I, I like it too much too, too. So a few of these people have left the group now, uh, but, but I still keep this image. Uh, but they are the people who've really been doing all this experimental work that I've talked about. And that's it. So I will stop sharing and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Nick. That was uh, that was quite a quite a tour de force. Um, so um, thank you. And, and I'm not sure we have many questions yet in the chat box. So we had a little bit of interrupt. Oh, OK. Uh, 
We yeah. had a bit of an interruption there in the sound. I'm not sure quite what happened there. Yeah, sorry. I apologise for that, Alan. I had a, I had a cup of tea delivered. Oh, ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Anyway, okay. Uh, it's uh, audience's chance to to fire away with some questions from for from uh, for, for Nick. If you'd like to um, unmute yourself and and un, and put your video on uh, and uh, wave your hands, we can uh, we can mm. start with some questions. Don't be shy. But could I maybe start with one, Nick? You, you kind of yes, touched on the thermodynamics. So how much of how much of this is a thermodynamic process alongside the chemistry? I think it's predominantly thermodynamic in the sense that um, what we're dealing with is an environment um, which is uh, continuously out of equilibrium because we have continuous flow of hydrothermal fluids which are rich in hydrogen uh, in the modern vents it's up to about 15 millimolar uh, equivalent hydrogen uh, and co2 and in the early oceans we don't know what it was exactly but but uh, you know potentially more than a bar of co2 back then uh, so the modern systems are somewhat carbon starved because they're alkaline and it precipitates out as carbonate but um but in in the older systems there would have been an overwhelming amount of co2 there uh, and so thermodynamically, <laughs> it nice. is it's it's hexagonic to be producing pretty much all of all of the biomolecules. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's simply an exothermic reaction. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Right. So then it's down to the catalysts. Yeah. Uh, Alan, we have a few hands up. We have a couple of hands up. Uh, there's one there from uh, from Victor. Victor. Victor, would you like yeah. to unmute yourself and ask you a question? Please? Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Yes. Yep, I, I had a, a question which might not be as knowledgeable as some of the other people's questions uh, in in the, in this session. Um, so you've 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 looked at the the life that we have and the building blocks that build up that life and kind of working backwards to um, some simple conditions where those building blocks might have might have um, had their origin. Um, is there a, another form of life? that could have developed rather than the one that we've got, or maybe it did develop at certain stages and then it it, it died out for some reason. It wasn't as successful um, in terms of the changing conditions on the planet from when life first formed. It may not have had any longevity associated with it. Is there some other thing that we could have um, that um, would have ended up with something completely different? Uh, in, in, potentially yes uh, and it, it's, uh, it's a very good question and it's one which uh, keeps me awake at night I think uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's um, there's, there's to my mind there's something a little bit uncanny about all of this metabolic biochemistry just happening in the absence of genes and information and, and, and some of it I can understand but the further we get from CO2 fixation, the more unbelievable it seems to be that uh, that in purine synthesis or well, py pyrimidine synthesis, we're working on purine synthesis, and it's, it's well, that's a bit hard work. Um, but um, we tend that you'd think there's all these side reactions that could happen and should happen, uh, and to a large extent don't happen. What we tend to see is is uh, small amounts of the intermediates along these known metabolic pathways forming spontaneously and interchanging between themselves at low low levels um and why why those ones why not other ones this is the the essence of your question mm. and i think a lot will depend yeah. on the starting point which is to say if we're starting with hydrogen and co2 at a particular temperature we're likely to get a certain metabolic network if you like and if we change the starting point to something else or we change the temperature or we change any of those parameters then easily you could get a different network mm. um so so why this network um it still seems uncanny but if you think about what the genes would be doing then as soon as we introduce information into this system there is a serious problem here which has been largely overlooked in my view uh about um how how an RNA world invents metabolism, which is the standard view, but 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 the, the RNA world of people have really got as far as trying to replicate RNA and haven't really worried themselves very much yet about how how, how you know as soon as soon as you've got something which is capable of self-replicating, then you've got a system which is capable of evolution and and and, and it's easy, lazy to put it aside there and say, okay, so it'll evolve. There is no conceptual problem. 
But there is a conceptual problem to my mind, because if you invent one enzyme that catalyzes one step in a metabolic pathway, and there's 10 steps in that pathway, then it's absolutely no use to you. You really need all 10 enzymes in that pathway. Hmm. Uh, and, and so it's beginning to look less probable. But, and you, and what's, what use is one pathway? You actually need multiple pathways to have anything that's any use to you. Hmm. So a, a more rigorous way of thinking about what, act, what entity is being selected and what are the reasons it's being selected, uh, you're left facing quite a large part of proto metabolism needs to be doing it to produce the, the required amino acids, nucleotides, sugars, whatever else is, is, is required to, to have a system which is capable of replicating itself. Um, and, and again, the, the problem is still, there's no point in having a, a, any one of those pathways by itself, um, mm. or at least there's no obvious point that I can see. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a serious combinatorial problem there um, that's never been seriously addressed. Mm. And I suspect it's borderline impossibly difficult. Um, but if what actually you see instead is a kind of a spontaneous proto-metabolism that happens to have a particular network structure to it, and what the first genes do is increase flux through that pathway, for example, by steepening the driving force, so increasing the fixation of CO2 to make the first intermediates in that pathway, then you get increased flux through the entire network. So that's not intrinsically very difficult. What that says then, if you take a step back, is that what the first genes are doing is amplifying the network. And so the fact that we get the same network and the entire thing is amplified is in fact a direct prediction of assuming that network comes first. Mm in which case we should be able to turn that on its head and say, okay, well, if, if we can look at the conditions that give rise to that entire network, then we should be able to predict the condition. You know, if we can get the entire network under this set of conditions, but not that set, then we might be able to say the conditions under which life arose. Mm. Mm. Well, that's very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, we have another question from uh, Chelsea Chen. Could you unmute yourself, please, Chelsea? And if you want to put your video on, we can see you too, perhaps. Uh, um, hello, can I just ask about why ATP um, can be spontaneously synthesized in water while other nucleosides can't? Uh, yes, you can ask. <laughs> um, I'd like to say I, I could answer. Uh, we, did, we did some molecular dynamic simulations on that. Um, and... It seems to be in part to do with the with the charge density on ferric iron. Ferric iron was necessary, and other 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 metal ions did not work in the same way. It seems to be partly to do uh, with the uh, actual orientation of the phosphate group of acetyl phosphate uh, in relation to the ferric iron and the ADP tail. I mean, we 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 came up with a, a potential explanation for the orientation. Some of it seems to be to do with the way that the ring nitrogens interact with ferric iron. And I don't understand that very well, but they interact very differently with, say, uh, guanine compared to uh, adenosine. Uh, so why, I'm not quite sure, but the prediction is that you, you, you know, molecular dynamic prediction is that you do not have the orientation of the acetyl phosphate in the right place. And, and, and it tends to abstract the catalyst. It abstracts the, the ferric ion, which interacts with the nitrogens on the ring instead. So we have some answers but I'm not persuaded that they're the right answers or that the molecular dynamic simulations are real. <laughs> I don't know enough of what's going on under the bonnet uh, with, the, with the atomic forces that they're predicting. Uh, I am not a, a, a chemist, I'm a biochemist, and, and I, you know, I, I, I try to get my hands dirty with all of this stuff, but it's, uh, I think we, we need a proper chemist to look at some of that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Jim Cunningham on the chat box there. Um, Nick, can you see that? Uh, oh, he's asking when 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 will the book come out about all this? It takes more than forty five <laughs> minutes to digest it all. <laughs> uh, well, I, I I I am trying to put together a proposal now to write a book on the origin of life, specifically covering more or less what I've said today. Ah. Uh, but it will be some years before it's written. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't, we're well, not. Please. 
I'm neither chemist nor biochemist, so <laughs> general science, if you like. I, I, I do have a book that was out last year that touches on some of the actual chemistry of the Krebs cycle mm. and, and, and some of the ideas I've just talked about now, so that's out already. But the genetic code stuff uh, is quite new, um, and I'm, I'm quite excited by it, but the pat going from a pattern to a predicted set of steps that we can then test that uh, I, I, I want to delay writing the book until we've done some of that and I have something to say about it. Mm, mm. But these, these steps you're predicting don't seem to depend uh, on specifically specific earth conditions, but perhaps earth-like conditions. Um, well, they Yes, they, 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 I mean, what we would get from this metabolic network is a, is a specific set of amino acids. Uh, and we would tend to get those amino acids and, and we would tend to, we would predict an order in which we get them as well. Um, the extent to which we would expect to see exactly the four bases that we see in RNA compared to a, a bunch of other possible ones that are, and there's a lot of modified bases around. Um, I'm less sure about that. So one thing we want to do is, is model metabolism where we're varying the thermodynamic parameters and kinetic parameters on each of the, but basically it's, it's more the thermodynamics than the kinetics. What's the likelihood of each reaction happening? And given that we have no clear idea, no clear data under the sets of conditions that we might be thinking about, if we, if we model it, we can vary across orders of magnitude. And obviously, if you make an oxidation reaction more likely, then a reduction step is less likely, and so on. So we can we can we can vary parameters um, in relation to each other and try to see how much of of metabolism we actually recover, and do we recover then the the, the core of it? Mm. In which case, we would expect to see exactly the same interactions somewhere else. In which case, if we discovered life on Mars and it has exactly the same genetic code, then it doesn't prove that. Uh, it was contamination um, or it may be that it's much looser than that and that um, that if you know if, if effectively we would expect to see some but not all or, or, or it's very contingent on which bases you produce and which ones get incorporated into RNA or DNA uh, then that would come up with a different set of predictions so there's a lot that we don't know or I don't know um, yeah. but, but there's a lot you know there's a, there's a huge amount that can be done here stuff so, yeah could, could I could I ask a quick supplementary on that, please, Nick? Um, you've been talking about the the bases you find in in RNA, and you mentioned uh, uracil. Yes. Whereas, as I recall, uh, in 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 DNA, we've got cytosine, guanine, alanine, and thymine. Have we not? Yes. Do we know Do we know why thymine came along as opposed to uracil in DNA? Um, I mean, there are ideas out there, um, and it's partly to do with stability. Um, hmm. And, uh, and 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 uh, decreasing the risk of mutations because if uh, I'm I'm, not, I'm probably going to get this wrong I, I can't quite remember but um, no. if 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 there is a I think an oxidation of uracil then uh, you end up with producing something very similar to one of the other bases oh. um, I I need to double check that uh, oh. in other words there there's more scope for um, for I suppose confusion, mm. Uh, mm. replacing the wrong base. So, mm. so that would be part of it. In part, um, RNA does not tend to form structures as stable as DNA, and I, I'm not sure that's to do with the bases so much as to do with um, the deoxy versus uh, ribose. Mm. Um, mm. But I, I don't, I, we've not really started thinking very much about DNA yet. It's plain that as soon as you've got DNA, you've got a much larger, much more stable structure, which is going to lower the error, er, error rate. Yes. Um, but uh, that's another, another reason I want to delay writing a book on this until I've, <laughs> until I've figured out how, how does DNA, <laughs> how does that fit into this picture? Right. Well, please don't delay it too long, Nick. We, I'd like to read it. <laughs> Um, now then, Chelsea Chen has a, had a supplementary, right. which if she's still around, she's welcome to read. Otherwise, I'll read it out. Are you there, Chelsea? Yes. Do you want to go ahead with your supplementary about purely RNA compounds? Uh, sorry, this is not no longer Chelsea Chen, but, but it's the same question. Do oh, we I'm know, sorry. 
Yes. Do we know Whoever if there, do we know <laughs> if, if there is uh if there are any RNA purely RNA compounds that are capable of catalyzing reactions such as uh condensing uh condensing amino acids or pept uh, or nucleotides? Um, well, I mean, there, there, there's been a lot of interest over decades in what's called the RNA world, uh, and, and there are plenty of ribozymes, which are basically catalysts, a bit like a, an enzyme. But enzymes are made of proteins, and ribozymes are made of RNA. Um, and RNA will tend to form into interesting shapes and knots and has uh, quite a wide range of catalytic functions, much less than proteins, but, uh, but, but certainly... Um, you know, capable of catalyzing quite complex chemistry. Uh, and so this has been the basis for what's been called the RNA world hypothesis. Um, and that really goes back to, to people like Leslie Orgel in the 1960s, in the late 1960s. Uh, and it, it, the ideas are very simple and very appealing, which is more or less that because of complementary base pairing, it's, it's, you know, conceptually very easy for an RNA to make a copy of itself. Whereas for a peptide to make a copy of itself is much more problematic and complex and, and difficult. Um, so if you were to say which comes first, then RNA has to come before peptides in that sense, at least as a hereditary mechanism. Mm. Um, but what that has tended to lead to is a rather purist view of an RNA world where, as I said, RNA invents everything else. It invents all of metabolism. And that view has been, I would say, receding over the last five to 10 years or so with a kind of recognition that chemistry is dirtier than that uh, and that there will be other things in there. There will be lipids in there. There will be amino acids, maybe peptides in there. And that we, we've, we've got a kind of a, a dirty RNA world. So there's no question that RNA is central to all of this um, and that that this was almost certainly the first code. And, and it's interesting that the ribosome, which are the big protein building factories in cells, they're basically ribozymes. Um, the, 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 the RNA content is very high. And as, as far as I'm aware, it's the ribozymes that are doing most of the catalysis of peptide bond formation. Um, mm. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting that they have an absolutely central critical job. And this is one thing that we're trying to think our way through to and, and do some experiments on as well. But it's a, it's, a, it's a highly populated area, you may say, because it's, uh, it's so central to the question. People have been working on it a lot for a long time. Mm. Um, ironically, RNA does not copy itself in cells. And this, this kind of holy grail of having a ribozyme that will copy itself, which was the, the essence of the RNA world, Actually, the, it's an enzyme that does that job. It's the RNA polymerase. It's a magnesium-dependent protein. Um, and so there's this, this interesting um, RNA effectively copies proteins and proteins copy RNA. So we're back in a strange chicken and egg situation that, uh, that, that is not easily unscrambled. Um, I've forgotten exactly what your question was, but essentially, could, how much work does RNA do? And the answer is it's very central to a lot of this. Um, but it, it's not the only thing that's going on. Uh, and I, I, I think peptides early are, are pretty necessary. Nick, that's been a very stimulating um, afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, before we go, um, you, 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 you've clearly got a collection of your fans here in the audience. Would you <laughs> like just to say, give a quick, uh, a quick commercial for the other book that you have written, very recently, the one on trans that you call Transformers. Oh, that's very kind of you. Yes, <laughs> why not? I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure I, I would be intellectually fair of me to overplug it because it's it's a book on the Krebs cycle, uh, which is not to everybody's taste. Right. Um, it attempts to link the chemistry that I touched on on the origin of life, which is which is making Krebs cycle intermediates from CO two and hydrogen. But I, ha I have a, a, another lab group at, uh, at UCL, which is working on mitochondrial function, so still en energetics and so on. Right. And it turned out both groups were measuring Krebs cycle intermediates for most of their lives. So uh, I had to put two and two together. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the Krebs cycle goes into reverse in cancer, for example, and it's, it's certainly, um, it, and, and then what's it doing? Well, it's driving cells copying themselves. It's instead of being about energy, it's about making the building blocks required to make a new cancer cell. So all of the lipids, all of the DNA and, and so on that's required. So metabolism, this central cycle in metabolism is central right across the whole spectrum of life from the origin of life 
up to um, to aging and cancer. And I, 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 there's an epilogue where I have a go at uh, linking it to consciousness as well, which is uh, beyond most people's tolerance uh, for <laughs> speculation in science. But that's where I finished with the book. So that's a, that's my plug for the book. But if you don't like metabolic biochemistry, then uh, then then you may uh, prefer just to watch a short talk online or something. Right. OK, well, thank you so much. Right. Well, we, we've had a wonderful afternoon, uh, uh, which I've hugely enjoyed and I'm sure everybody else has. So without ado, I'd, apart from thanking you again, I'd like to pass over to our chairman, uh, Professor David Southwood. If I don't have right. his screen up in front of me, but uh, David, over to you, if I may. Well, thank you, Alan. And Nick, thank you very much for an invigorating afternoon. Um, <clears throat> origin of life, I think, how can, how can we not be interested in it? And how can we not feel some of the emotions that you clearly feel? <laughs> the curiosity of it, the, um, the fact that things have come out of it, and yet there we are. It's one of the big mysteries that we live with as human beings, in my view. So mm -hmm. I really think you've taken on, us on a wonderful voyage, and your enthusiasm is absolutely magnificent. I think you're completely <laughs> to communicate. I much admire. And um, so I think if I can ask people generally to unmute or to use the symbol for clapping uh, to give you a sign that we really did appreciate <laughs> your time this uh, time this afternoon. So thank you very much.